panelists introduce themselves um, and then we will just kind of get going and I have some questions I prepared but I, I really prefer if it's just a more casual um, conversation so if we're talking about something and you have a question please just kind of jump in and um, so I'll start with Asia if you want to introduce sure. yourself. Sure I'm Asia May I'm the Vice President of Marketing at the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites. We actually have 12 locations around the state. We're not just the museum. So uh, if you've been to TC Steel or Levi Coffin or New Harmony, those are all our sites as well. Um, and I've just been with the museum since February. Prior to that, I spent 10 years doing higher ed marketing. So I've had a little bit of a switch in industry. <laughs> uh, I'm Willie Mavis, Communications Coordinator for Gleaners Food Bank of Indiana. I've uh, been there since last August, so I think that's what, a year and a few months. Um, uh, graduated from Wabash College in 2010 and just kind of uh, brought, got into the nonprofit industry and it's been my passion ever since. And what I like most about social media is um, what we're talking about today, um, giving the tools to the fundraisers to help them retain donors and attract new donors, things of that sort. Cool. Uh, I'm Steven Shattuck. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Bloomerang. Um, went to Ball State. I uh, spent most of my career on the agency side. Um, I did a, a lot of work for nonprofits uh, at, a, at an agency for about four or five years, uh, videos and things like that. And then uh, spent some, some time on the for profit side. Now I'm kind of back home uh, here at Bloomerang. So, yeah, thanks for all of you for being here. Cool. Um, I think we, we could just kind of start out um, kind of broadly, but just how you, like based on the type of donor you're trying to reach, how does that affect what type of digital communications or social media that you, you would use, I guess? Um, at the museum, we definitely use uh, our high level, level donors, definitely receive more print pieces, they receive more. <coughs> sort of written, handwritten things, um, a lot more snail mail than maybe our other uh, donors, our general members. We rely a lot on social media, e-news, um, to reach them. Um, but in general, for our social media channels, we try and keep a two-to-one ratio of two stories that are just pure fun facts or did you knows or interesting content to everyone, sort of promotional plug. Um, we find that people get really, really tired of that really fast, and we are promoting a lot of different things. Um, you know, we've, I've got 50 events between now and the end of the year that I'm promoting, and so with that plus any um, donor <laughs> yeah. things, it can be a lot, and suddenly you're an infomercial. So yeah. we're, we try and keep that ratio. Mm -hmm. That's what I think the, the way we go about it is, um, I mean, the good, the good thing about social media you can they you can opt in to any level that you want no matter it's kind of on the, the donor to choose what channels they want to hear from you um, if they're good with just getting the direct mail and sending in their two hundred fifty dollar check um, every quarter then that's what they're going to do um, and then just being um, wise about how many asks you're putting out through like email um, on social media on Facebook on Twitter. Um, just because you know that people will be getting that either a lot or very little. Um, and so just what I'm taking um, here in the next couple of months is just working with our donor relations team more, um, seeing who kind of the higher donors are, and then kind of scrubbing our email list to see if we can segment out. Because um, I really think that with your top-level donors, email is probably... Uh, the best way to go to keep in touch with them um, and then kind of just using that as a medium of letting them know where else you are on the online space so that if they do want to opt in and check you out on Facebook or follow you on Twitter then you can see that and find out that, that this person is a little bit more tech savvy so then what's the next level we can take with them. Yeah, and I would just add that um, as an observer um, and not someone who necessarily runs any nonprofit accounts. I think it's important to s stay on top of the trends and understand where where things are going and where people are moving. You know, for example, you know the the fastest growing segment of Facebook I read somewhere is 50 to 65 year olds, mm -hmm. which that's sort of a a shift in the thinking, right? You think you know social media is going to be younger, 
you know, that's, that may start to change. So just you know, pay attention to those things. And, and conversely, teenagers are leaving Facebook, right? So they're going to these other mediums, whether it be Twitter or you know, Snapchat and these, other, and these other things. So I think it's important to just understand how those things are changing and just kind of keep an eye on it because those teenagers, you know, they could be donors in five years, seven years, ten years. So, so know where they're going to be, you know. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask a question? For sure, yeah. Um, Asia, when you said that you're, you do more print towards your top donors, I'm curious about the um, strategy behind that because with our organization, a lot of our higher level donors are sort of an aging population. Mm -hmm. So that really struck home to me that like they should, we've been focusing a lot on the um, web and social media, like getting that going with our organization, but um, why is the state museum you know, using print with your top donors? Is it the same reason? We, yeah, same, okay. same reason. Our top donors tend to be a little, a little older, and um, we also feel like there's a great opportunity to really personalize communication mm -hmm. then. Okay. So whether it's just writing a note on a postcard, um, oh, glad we saw you at the last event or the last exhibit opening or whatever, mm -hmm. that at least it shows that we're, we're paying attention to them. It's not just a one-way communication. And don't you expect those, that tier, expect you to really know them yes. and Absolutely. recognize them, obviously, Absolutely. like you just said. Yeah. Okay. Well, what's your break point for that? You said that there's top-level donors. Those what is your who, definition of that? We have different donor sure. levels within the museum. Our Icon Society is our top level at the museum, and it's 15 hundred dollars a year or more um, and so that's really obviously we have tiers within the icon society but um, that that's our general top tier mm -hmm. and i think if you're if you're sending a lot of print to top donors too like every now and again being able to put kind of like one or two sentences of saying like hey we are on the online world if you would like to connect with us mm -hmm. because you, you mentioned you are putting a lot of emphasis on um, going digital and what I'll, I see a lot with organizations who they understand the importance of social media and being online now um, that they're just making the switch and not really telling anybody about it you can't really forget to tell your top donors who do rely on that print to come through the mail and mm -hmm. to send their check with a stamp on an envelope um, that hey you may be getting <coughs> less mail and this is the reason why um, I, that's just from talking with a couple organizations who are making the switch. They're bringing that up, like, "Hey, how are you telling your offline people that you're going more online?" And they're they're saying, "Oh, I didn't really think about letting mm -hmm. them know." So that, that's one thing to keep in mind. And giving them a choice too. Mm -hmm. I've seen direct mail pieces that say, "You know, would you like to receive less direct mail and more email, or mm -hmm. or uh, you know, write in your social media accounts so we can follow you?" Like those those kinds of things. Being proactive about it, even in the direct mail piece, those can be very effective too. Mm -hmm. How do you separate donors from prospects in terms of where, where, how to reach them? Do you have a separate list for even that? Um, <clears throat> in the online space, uh, what I do for gleaners is kind of separate it out into people who have run food drives for us, people who have volunteered for us, um, and then maybe people who have just kind of like retweeted or posted about us. Um, so I kind of see those more as prospects in the online realm, if you will. Um, I haven't really double checked that with our uh, database, donor database. Um, so I haven't really dove into that very much. I finally got um, a grasp through the past year on how we want to move people through the funnel online. Um, so just kind of seeing those, those initial people that interact with you online and seeing how to engage them more and trying to move them up and then further uh, running those reports and seeing if they are getting put into the donor database because they have gone online and given a gift and then making that extra effort after that I think is the, the best next step um, for us moving forward. For us, I mean, we definitely treat anyone who's following us on Facebook, anybody on Twitter, they're a prospective donor for us. Mm -hmm. And our job is to really make that experience an extension of the museum experience. So you're going to get all Indiana fun facts, all Indiana history or culture or natural science. Um, because we want them to come in the building. Because we think once they're in the building, we have a much better chance, obviously, of capturing them either as a member or as a, a donor donor. So. 
Well, and something, I don't think Sarah Croft is here, but her and I talked about once, she has a challenge when she's interacting on Twitter specifically, getting interactions with individuals on Twitter. So she'll get retweets from other organizations or sister organizations in other cities, but to actually engage with prospective donors on Twitter, she has a big challenge there. So do you, have you guys had that challenge or found a way to get around it? I, I think it's always tough, um, and I, I talked with Sarah about the same thing because of their lack of kind of volunteer opportunities. I feel like pretty blessed because we had over 21,000 individuals come through our door, our warehouse to volunteer, so a lot of people will tweet about that and you can instantly just say thank you yeah. and be able to do that in, in individual interaction. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's just um, seeing what people talk about and then um, when they say something relevant to your organization, jumping into the conversation. Almost like when you're first starting on Twitter as an individual and trying, especially if you're doing it, doing it as like a professional brand, you're checking out those hashtags that you're interested in. Um, I would say join a Twitter chat about um, different things, different talking heads, and then you'll connect with individuals um, on a level because they see that you're going into the conver conversation with individuals rather than just other organizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think speaking from a donor's perspective, the things that engage me are when I see an individual talking about a nonprofit rather than like the nonprofit account. Talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, yeah. So like I know way more about Gleaners from Willie's personal Twitter account than the Gleaners account, which I don't even think I follow. Mm -hmm. And and there's other Gleaners people that mm -hmm. are engaging and and that's how I see what they're up to. Um, and that's that's way more powerful than just the corporate account, I think. Mm -hmm. And the same for the museum and every, you know any other nonprofit that I'm aware of. It's it's the people who work there. It's the people who are advocates for it, um, who are talking about it online. That's what engages me, rather than just you know the one corporate account who you know you're talking to a logo and you don't really know who's behind it. So that's mm -hmm. that, that's sort of a barrier right there. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I think is is effective from, from that standpoint. We seem to see a lot more individual conversations happen on Facebook mm -hmm. than Twitter for us. Mm -hmm. it, may, it may be very well the nature of what we do because we get very specific questions of, I found this little toaster, is it <laughs> 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 from 1959 or 1960? And you're like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I research toasters. Show, like, <laughs> so, um, so we get a lot more of that than we do on Twitter. We get a lot of other companies or organizations. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of the conversation Sarah and I had was like, maybe Twitter just isn't where you're going to engage with them. Right. Like, yeah. it might be a challenge for a reason that you just mm -hmm. need to spend more time on Facebook or with your email campaign or whatever. Yeah, it definitely, like, Twitter is a very good, like, handshake, I think. Handshake and then how quickly can you get them onto your email list or mm -hmm. into volunteer or on your uh, direct mailing list especially for organizations that don't have that direct volunteer experience mm -hmm. where people can Instagram a picture and then mm -hmm. tag you and you'll be right. mentioned on Twitter. Um, but one thing that I've been wanting to do moving forward too is being able to either survey or find those donors who are active on Twitter or somebody who... Or board member. Board member or a committee member or somewhere and engaging them saying hey we do need help reaching out to individuals online and we recognize that people would rather um, engage with a face rather than a logo mm -hmm. so would you mind being able to do this for us maybe send three tweets a month or something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. um, i've seen that be effective for some other groups and we recently did that for one of our events was um, engage a group to that came to our Harvest Moon Gala and they were the ones that were able to engage with other individuals about our special event that night and everything like that. Mm -hmm. You guys own social media that night. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, that was a really good idea. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Got a lot of help from that, so Muhammad Yasin, if he sees that video. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Do, do you find that you guys need to spend with anybody. You, you, every time you have a visitor in your food bank warehouse,
watch you take a picture. Mm -hmm. Post it right away. And I don't think people get over annoyed by that because you're a nonprofit. Like you're doing some good. And they go, oh, it's too many timeline pictures mm -hmm. on Facebook. Well, it's a deck of food banks, so. though. Right. <laughs> so the nonprofits get a pass on the, if they're doing good mm -hmm. than most companies. Well, I'm glad you said that because I do I do get a little um, weary when my volunteer because my volunteer coordinator I gave her the reins of posting those albums for groups and I when I first started I was like whoa I think we're posting on Facebook way too much like it, it sometimes and then like it, if it's a busy day they won't get to uploading the albums till the next day so then it's like bang, 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 right there at 9 in the morning, and then a group comes in, and they're posting another one at noon, and then they have an afternoon group, and they post in the afternoon. And I'm like, when am I going to be able to post something <laughs> about yeah. what we're doing? What about me? Um, but I think then it, it was a conversation I started having with our volunteer coordinator like on how important it is to um, do that for our groups because that is something that's special to the volunteer experience. I'm sure you guys see it for the museum experience. Um, when groups come in, we say that at the very start is, hey, we're going to be around with a camera, um, and these pictures will be posted pretty much before you leave. So on your way out the door, get out your phone and like us on Facebook. And, and so that really helped generate a lot of likes. Um, and so I'm glad you said that, uh, oh, it's okay, they're, they're, food <laughs> bank, they're doing that for their volunteers, because uh, I hope that's the way it's getting recognized. Um, but then strategically, I go in every day and see if there's volunteer groups coming in. Um, so then I know that I need to schedule my posts to go out that night if it's about a campaign that's going on or a fundraiser that's coming up um, because I know we won't have any albums go out around 8.30 at night. So I can send something that day. Uh, but don't but, you think it's it depends on the type of content? Like mm -hmm. if they mm -hmm. were posting that frequently and like every time was a push for donations, mm -hmm. it would definitely get yeah. annoying and right. possibly an unlike or something. But you're thanking your you're basically not just well, I mean, you're thanking them publicly and then it gets them more yeah, I like them. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's and that was another thing too, is like know your online spaces and what audience goes to the online space. I mean, it took me to, to step back and because I had my own kind of agenda with Facebook where, like, we do need to do more camp campaign style stuff. But then I really thought about it. I mean, our audience on the Facebook space is volunteers. It was built by our volunteer managers telling them that, hey, like us on Facebook, you'll see your picture and be able to engage with us. So that is all volunteers. It's not necessarily prospective donors that are going to give the big dollars. It's the people that really want to give their time. Mm -hmm. um, so then kind of changing your angle on um, what avenue you're using. And so then recognizing who follows you on Twitter, who's on your email list, and being able to see what types of donors or prospects are in those spaces and keying your message that way. I think a really important thing as we go through is just being able to kind of measure what you do and measure kind of um, either by dollars or by just a simple measurement of number of followers or whatever. So are there specific numbers or measurements that you guys look at to kind of see how successful you're being or if you need to change it up? Or We have an overall marketing dashboard that we do every month that tracks social media amongst, you know, web tips and all that, all that good stuff. Um, so we definitely are tracking it. Um, it's really helpful for us, um, since we're so exhibit driven, um, to see that helps us project where we're going with the exhibit. Um, but then it also helps us measure some of the success of the social media work we've done during that exhibit. Um, I've, like, so we had Star Wars this summer. That was a big hit, and everybody loved seeing their picture with Darth Vader on Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so my kids are for Halloween, yeah. thanks to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was really helpful to, to for us to see what kind of, even Star Wars pictures people like. Mm -hmm. They definitely wanted the picture of the individual visitor with a character. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were able to schedule more characters because we knew that that's why people were coming in addition to the exhibit. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm a guy who doesn't get too caught up on followers. Like, followers don't really excite me too much. Um, I'd rather have, you know, 100 
really dedicated, loyal followers than a thousand followers who don't really do exactly, too much. Exactly, yeah. Um, you, know, you know, key performance indicators for me would be engagement and conversions. You know, did someone see a tweet and click through to it and make a donation or attend an event or volunteer? Um, or did they share a message that was asking for those things? Um, that, those sort of engagement metrics are what I look at. And how do, you, how do you find those metrics? I mean, how do you follow that individual's progress? It, yeah, it's hard if you don't have any sort of, you know, right. analytics tool or CRM. You know, a lot of it you can do manually. You know, you can see if someone retweets you, you know, record that manually and then, and then look at your database or whatever you're using and see if they went ahead and made a donation. And you can kind of connect the dots that way. Um, um, you know, so it, it can be tricky. Uh, but it's definitely good to do those things because then you can see, well, you know, maybe that set us updated that campaign wasn't as successful as this one. This one sort of seemed to lead to a lot of donations or whatever conversion you want. Um, so it can be challenging, but it's worth digging into it because you can just be better informed of what you're doing going forward. That was the one tool that I got us uh, hooked into a couple months ago uh, because when I first started, we were still kind of back in the, just doing the things manually, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> so Sprout Social is what I um, yeah. like the most. It's really good. Um, I like scheduling and everything through Hootsuite, um, but um, as far as social media tracking and engagement and metrics um, for Twitter and Facebook, I think the analytics, uh, are, yeah, really the good. analytics are really good. Mm -hmm. And so picking out those key performance indicators like Stephen said, and then being able to maybe overlay, we use the tapestry, so overlay like how many donations came through, the amount of donations that came through day by day. Um, once I get a couple more months of tracking under our belt, I hope to go back and be able to kind of overlay, see how many tweets went out this week, how many donations came in, is there correlation, was there an event, um, and being able to do that. Um, or seeing what the engagement numbers were that week rather than how many tweets um, or so seeing is there a correlation between the amount of retweets we get and how many $10 donations we get. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of keying in on those uh, for tracking, uh, that's because we were in a similar uh, spot when I joined the organization where people were like, all right, we're getting, we got this many fans, we got this many fans, <laughs> we got this many followers, we keep building. Which is good. Yeah, it is. You do want to, you do want to follow me. It helps your reach, but uh, at the end of the day, you want people engaging with you online. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys, we talked a little bit about the volunteer um, organizers or other people in that role, but how do you get other people within your organization to kind of help or mm -hmm. assist with reaching out to donors? Mm -hmm. Really hard. Yeah. <laughs> Giving people one more thing to do. <laughs> Well, I, I heard, uh, sorry for just jumping in and going first, but um, <clears throat> I was at the MCON uh, uh, yeah. conference for uh, about millennial donors uh, that's put on by Achieve. Uh, that was here at the Alexander at the start of the year. And I forget who it was who was speaking, but she was talking about getting other people in your organization involved in the online world. And... Uh, she is a marketer, and she said she makes it a point to go to lunch once a day with someone in the programs department. Um, so just like sitting down uh, once once a week with someone in the programs department and kind of learning about what they do on day to day, and then seeing like if they are on the online world uh, somewhere, because our chief programs officer, I never would have guessed. But she, I started talking to her a couple weeks ago, and she mentioned doing a Google Plus Hangout with her kids. And I was like, wow, you're, like, you're doing Google Plus Hangout? And, <laughs> and so what else do you do? And she's like, I'm on Twitter. I've done. Right. And it's not like she's actively using it, but you learn that people do find value, and, it, and you can start that conversation with them um, and get them involved. And uh, I've talked about this before, too. You, you try, when you come in, to set like a social media campaign where you, you get all of the managers and the officers buy-in and then like you go down to the people and you're like, hey, I mm -hmm. want to vlog from you. Like, 
tw twice a month. Is that okay? And then like it rolls around and you have to keep nagging them, nagging them. When in reality, it's better like if you if you start from the bottom and kind of see who would want to blog for you, get them to start pushing some of those out. Then they start talking about it with coworkers. Like, hey, did you see my blog that went out on the, the Gleaner Speed and everything like that? And mm -hmm. so then it kind of rallies it from the bottom. Even even non riders just 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 advocates. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Do you pay them extra, or do you just? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had enough to pay them extra. <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, I try and do an editorial calendar about three months out, so four times a year. I'm doing a call out for um, content for the next three months. Since we are so exhibit and event driven, it's actually pretty easy for us to find a lot of things to sort of paying off. You know, we've got a, a big ice age. Um, exhibit coming up in November, so we're all about paleontology lately. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, you know, working with those curators or the program officers um, who are doing the hands-on stuff with the visitors, um, they know more than they think they know that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, they've been doing it for so long that they are like, oh yeah, well we did that, you know. And yeah. It's like, that's really cool. You yeah. can... They have the best <laughs> stories. Yeah. Yeah, they really and they don't the realize best. it yeah. until you do sit down at lunch and mm -hmm. they just start talking and, I don't know, as a marketer, you know, you're know, you like, yeah. that's a really great mm -hmm. blog. Yeah, Let's exactly. talk more about this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I, mean, I think getting them in the habit of also looking for that, those stories. Right. Um, for the first time, we've done a, a dig in southern Indiana every year for the last 26 years. This year, for the first time, they brought an iPad with them, and so they recorded it when they found oh, this okay. fifty thousand year old peccary pig, you know. Yeah. And yeah. so, you, and then they emailed them to me from Jasper, you know, uh -huh. they had to drive in to get service. But the <laughs> fact that they're willing to do that, and then they're excited about it, and they mm -hmm. see that it's shared, and then it gets picked up by national media, then it creates that cycle of <laughs> reinforcement that this is really a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then it's something for them to hold on to too. Mm -hmm. You know, they have that. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a problem I'll be trying to solve the rest of my career. Basically, getting people internally to be more active on social media, contribute content, and you know, Asia said it. You know, setting them up for success, equipping them with an editorial calendar, equipping them with things that you should talk about, and, and maybe doing a little bit of training and orientation rather than just saying, "Hey, executive director, you should just, you should join Twitter." Okay, and then. Oh no! What happens then? Yeah, if that's not a recipe for success. Mm -hmm. And choosing your battles too. I think um, my wife has been a fundraiser her whole career. She was at Joy's House before her previous position, and you know, small nonprofit, ten people. Um, she's the only active person online in the organization, so she had to overcome this challenge. And you know, starting with the executive director, you know, she looked at social networks that she used already. Um, and encouraged her to do more there rather than jump into a new one. Mm -hmm. So that was Facebook for her. Um, and not terribly active on social media anyway, but you know, willing to speak at events, obviously, mm -hmm. willing to, to go on radio shows. So kind of choosing what medium and what outlet works for them. You know, there were other people in the organization who took to Twitter really well, um, having never used it. So just looking for you know, not necessarily saying, hey, join every social network and, and do everything there, but choosing the one that's sort of a right fit for them and then equipping them for success is important. Uh, you had a question? Well, I don't want to take your hand. No, no, I, you're fine. Right. You, 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 uh, you were talking about uh, what performed right for you, and um, yeah. still, still from your presentation to the social media group <laughs> recently, where you talked about the right platform, yep. which social platform. Um, for example, if you were giving advice about this, would you use Google Plus or would you use Twitter? It, I mean, it depends on the organization. Mm -hmm. um, Google Plus may be a good fit for organizations. Uh, it may be better for, you know, Twitter may be better for others. Google Plus is really nice, like, Google Plus Hangouts are mm -hmm. awesome because it's a really easy way to make a video. It records straight to your YouTube channel. Um, you don't need to get a camera or hire some video company to make you a video. You could, you could do an interview with your executive director, you could do an interview with volunteers. Or whatever, and then you've got an awesome piece of content that you can share later. Um, but in terms of choosing the networks, I think you have to look where the donors are, who your demographics are, who are the people you're trying to reach, and where are they, and focus there. Well, I'm glad that I heard Asia talk about the editorial calendar. I don't know if you send it out. Do you send it out to everybody in your organization? Uh, I send out a request to everybody. Okay, yeah. and that's a, a what I found helps too is even if it's really raw. 
like just mm -hmm. just putting like all of your what you plan on blogging about in the next mm -hmm. month sending that out to um, people in, in programs or in key areas they then that's in the back of their mind on saying hey this kind of connects and they'll send an email a picture to you mm -hmm. um, and it just kind of gets them engaged and so you might not have that person that mm -hmm. will say yeah I'll jump right into Twitter and start using hashtags this afternoon mm -hmm. Um, but they might blog. Yeah, or you might have that person that says, "Here's a picture. I think that here, like, it'll be good to put on the online." Mm -hmm. And they won't even know which space it should go on to. But mm -hmm. once once you just start letting them know, then they start thinking about it in a marketing way. Mm -hmm. And if you're going after blog posts, there is a lot of creative ways to get blog posts out of people too, who aren't natural writers. Like here at Bloomerang, like Jay and Jay Love and I are natural writers, and it's no problem getting us to blog once a week or whatever. But we have you know, other experts in the building who are experts on fundraising and all this stuff we're talking about, but aren't natural writers. So I don't just say, hey, can you write a blog post? Mm -hmm. And if I did that, they would agonize over it for months and then you know, not really hand it in. But you know, I would say, hey, have you, is there a, a question from a customer that you, at, that you answer a lot? Mm -hmm. it's, the blog post is probably already in your email. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you, we could just do an interview. You, know, you could interview your executive director or volunteer and the, the text of that conversation, that's a great blog post. So you don't have to necessarily have someone sit down at a blank sheet of paper, which can be terrifying for a lot of people. Um, there are ways to maybe you know, repurpose things or, or crowdsource content that way. That can be really helpful. Yeah. And I think to get back to donor retention too is, are, do you guys have those top donors that are always engaged with the organization? Maybe they're people that you can start sending the mm -hmm. editorial calendar to and yep. saying, hey, here's a heads up of what's going out on our online space. Be on the lookout for it. Share it if you can. Uh, share it with your friends because I'm sure they know other people that could become top donors or maybe just under the top donor level from them, but they're friends, so they pull them up with them. Uh, just, I, I think when people have have a heads up on what's coming out and they feel more comfortable sharing it or mm -hmm. they think about how they can share it or who they share it with. And those people can be content creators too, those top donors. If they're really engaged with the organization, they may write for your blog, they may write a guest post, they may, you know, they've, they'll certainly be active on social media on your behalf, but don't be afraid to ask those people for those yeah. things. You don't get what you don't ask for usually. You could have a, you know, like a feature a board member once yep. a month or, mm -hmm. you know, obviously only if they're comfortable with it and mm -hmm. not. I think intimidation is a lot of it, mm -hmm. you know, just unfamiliar. So maybe at a board meeting you do a quick um, training or a quick education mm -hmm. on what a blog post is, mm -hmm. and, you know, how, how do you create it and go about it. Um, Did your calendar get kicked back a lot? Did people give you feedback and say, hey, that's wrong, or um, did you change it much? Nothing uh, huge with, like, there's something wrong with this, uh, because I do it... Uh, Two months in advance and so that they're not really sure what's what exactly is going to come up um, in those months to come um, really they'll be like oh well we can definitely send this to this specific group this blog or you definitely need to talk to this programs person to get more insight on that blog um, and so it's really more uh, they give me more work rather than some kickback uh, so, but it, it's kind of nice because then people people's wheels start turning on who they want to give it to um, after it goes out, or they let me know who else I need to talk to before I um, put anything out there that's wrong. So I think that it's more cautionary, like, hey, make sure you check with so and so before you post about this because we might have updated numbers now or something like that. When you talk about planning your content and kind of looking forward. You know, what types of content, and it's going to depend on the organization, but, you know, what speaks mostly to donors? You know, is it a, just a direct, you know, donate here, like a direct ask? Or is it, you know, a blog post where you're featuring a story of something, you know, a real impact you made to the community? Or, you know, any opinions there? Or I, I think um, I'm actually giving a presentation about this. At AFP next month, and I put my slides together yesterday, and this is uh, really important. So, if you're a nonprofit that is associated with Alzheimer's, for example, in some way, um, the the things that I would blog about wouldn't be about the organization at all. I would blog about 
Alzheimer's and you know Alzheimer's prevention and Alzheimer's caregiving tips and all these things that people are looking for mm -hmm. in association with Alzheimer's. And if you can put that content in front of people who are looking for it, it's going to build credibility in your organization. So no one is searching for, I need to find an Alzheimer's association that I want to donate to. Like that search doesn't happen. But searches that do happen are, I'm a caregiver, I need help you know, taking care of my aging parent who has Alzheimer's. If you can put that content on your website somehow, that's going to attract people who may become donors, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking at, you know, the, that sort of top of the, the donor funnel, that's the, that's the content you want there. And then once they're there, then, then having other content about your organization and all the great things you do, once they're there, that's going to help them move through to a donation, hopefully. Yeah, we, we've actually sort of begun to think about, especially on social media, but in other ways, the museum is almost like a lifestyle brand, um, but our lifestyle is what it is to, to be a Hoosier to live in Indiana. And so that means that we'll retweet, we'll retweet, we'll repost things about high school basketball or um, I don't know, <coughs> Colts football or things like that that are really like what football. it is to be yeah. a Hoosier. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, we've seen an increase in our followers, I think, because of that and because People know that it's content that is content that they're looking for. You know, they're interested to see why Vincennes was called Vincennes, or if yeah. they're from Knox County, or you know, right. um, how do we keep them engaged in that way so it really is content <coughs> relevant to them and not so much this, you know, megaphone of mm -hmm. donate now, volunteer here, come to this event now. Um, mm -hmm. It's weird. The less you talk about yourself, yeah, like right. the better it is. It's amazing how that happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you that space would have been taken by somebody else if you hadn't jumped in and done that? I think, well, to some degree. You know, we've got our natural competitors in the state, our historic landmarks um, and the History Center. Um, what's different about us is we have the three-dimensional objects. Yeah. Um, the Historical Society has the papers and the photographs. We have the cars and the tractors and the toasters and <laughs> things like that. Um, and we also have a statewide network in a way that people don't. Our, one of our largest challenges, we've got the museum in Indianapolis. People in Indianapolis care about the museum. We've got Gene Stratton Porter, Sklog Cabin in Rome City, Indiana. They don't care about the museum at all. <laughs> and so um, how do we make it just as applicable to Rome City as it is in Indiana Indianapolis? Um, and that's a constant sort of struggle for us because we're all living in Indianapolis and so very quickly suddenly mm -hmm. everything is about Indy and it's not about the whole state. So. so in that situation do you create like a separate account or do you do everything through the state museum? Um, Twitter is more everything. Mm -hmm. um, Facebook we've got separate accounts for each of the 11 historic sites okay. um, because it is so very specific to right. um, their location in a lot of ways, um, but we share back and forth where we think it's appropriate. Okay. Do you ever purchase content for like a blog post? Or like oh no, I mean our, our issue is that we've got too much content to be honest. Um, we've That's got good. a staff of curators and a staff of program specialists who know just so much that often our issue is more weeding it down than it is. I mean, we're, that's a good thing in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, it's like, oh my God, <laughs> you've only got a hundred words. You don't have a thousand words to say this, so that's a, a big challenge for us. How do you dance around um, politically sensitive topics? We work in public health, and so a lot of the things that our um, the audience wants to talk about right now is the Affordable Care Act. And we want to provide them useful and meaningful information on that. We also want to engage with them, but we don't want to put anyone else off. Mm -hmm. That's, I think I can uh, speak on that uh, because we're kind of dealing with a similar issue with uh, the sunsetting of SNAP benefits. Um, and it's not really a direct cut or anything like that. It's just they're kind of rolling back from the stimulus. And, um, and especially during the government shutdown, a lot of talk was around what's going to happen with WIC, Women, Infant, and Children. Um, and our line's going to get bigger. And... So I think what people in the online world um, want to see are are you not are people not beating a dead horse or um, being over dramatic about their ask? Um, I think what the way you brought your question was you do want to be helpful 
And so how do you ward that? And I think it's just, I mean, it's just saying the, the need is going to grow or the, the need is going to get stronger. The demand is going to be there. Um, so we need your support. We need your help um, with, with that demand. <clears throat> We're not telling you that you need to pick up a sign and pick it tomorrow um, or anything like that. But it's just you know, we got to batten down the hatches and it's going to take our entire community to help those people that may need more help now in the future. Um, and so, and then not being afraid to ask those questions, um, cause you're going to get a little bit of kickback, kickback from people, but honestly, the, those people were probably looking for something to get mad at your organization about anyways. <laughs> um, and so they were just waiting for that one time. And so, so maybe you'll make them mad that one time and then, but if you've gone through and had, have had good engagement in the past, you'll get those supporters that will come. And, and help you online where they'll say that's really not the way it is um, you're blowing this out of proportion like if you get a negative comment on Facebook if you've kind of built that online community of supporters then other people will be able to comment for you and say hey no I've been through the process this is this is how they take care of X Y and Z um, and, and that's that. where your employees, your volunteers, your board member, you know, mm -hmm. where all those people who are so close to your organization mm -hmm. and engaged on social media, mm -hmm. that's where I did work with Planned Parenthood for a while, so I'm very familiar with that mm -hmm. really touchy, yeah. like, wow, could we be any more, right. <laughs> you know, careful here? So, so yeah, it's having that network of, or even if they're just, maybe they're not, volunteer but they're just a really good social media influencer and they really believe in what you do mm -hmm. um having that backing is huge well, i think it's huge too before you put any piece out there that might be a little touchy or a little sensitive is give everybody in your organization a heads up or at least mm -hmm. the people who yeah. do see that feel those phone calls or feel those emails like hey this is what's going out do i need to think about these bullet points do I need to scale back? Do I need to change anything up? Are these stats correct? Um, because they're the ones that will field the phone calls after you click send on that email. Um, and so, yeah, it, it is a tough balance because you're like, man, can I be any more vague about really what's going on? Um, and you're like, is this really going to make an impact? Because we don't, we aren't very direct about it, but it's just the nature of it. Well, and I also think, you know, it's, Yes, you want to provide accurate information, but you also don't want to go totally the other way and become this defensive. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You're right. wrong! Yes. No. <laughs> this sort of, I think being positive sort of thing. is so, and so mm -hmm. that is, um, you know, sometimes it's okay to just let it lie there for a second. You know, mm -hmm. in two hours, nobody's going to see it. Mm -hmm. right. um, and so having perspective rather than that instant sort of, oh, God, they're wrong, and now I have to correct them mm -hmm. right the second. Mm -hmm. um, let mm -hmm. it percolate a little bit and just see where the conversation is going and not treating every comment like it's do or die, right. I guess. Well, that's what we saw that with the government shutdown was we didn't really hop onto that um, topic until we kept getting calls from media, like mm -hmm. what, what, how is this going to affect you guys? And so we, I thought of it, I was like, well, we need to put out our own content to be able to tell our story from our words and not leave it in the hands of uh, any media who are looking for that striking content. Um, and it's it's funny how like one word can kind of uh, change the meaning of a sentence where it's like whether somebody says Gleaners relies heavily on government food um, when in actuality only about 20% of the food that comes through our warehouse is from the government. Uh, a lot of it comes from donations and from purchasing our own. So if they would have just taken out heavily, then we would have been fine. Like we, we rely and that's even kind of a stretch. But so it, it's just being proactive about being able to put out your own content to tell your own story and say this is, we're going to be affected on all mm -hmm. these different bullet points. We need your support. I sit on the marketing and communications committee for SACOA, which is the Central Indiana mm -hmm. Council on Aging, or they used to be called that, now there's SACOA. Um, and they have to deal with this issue. This exact question came up in a previous meeting. And what they decided was, rather than producing their own content and kind of putting themselves out on a limb, 
uh, for you know the efficacy of the content. They decided let's let's source crowd you know content from elsewhere from people we trust and who appear to be credible and present that content. Then we can say, well, this expert is saying this, and this agency is saying this, and this other expert is saying this, and then they're being helpful, but they're not necessarily putting themselves on the line. And that worked pretty well. The trick there is just you know making sure that content is you know legit and trustworthy. Right. So I guess that, that's a great lead-in into kind of what are some of the leader organizations or organizations that people could follow in terms of people that are using digital as a great way to retain donors and attract donors. Yeah, I think, I think that the answer I always hear that question is like the big guys, like Charity <coughs> Water is one I hear a lot and all, and all these other things. I, I think you can look locally to the smaller guys in your community and see what they're doing. Like Gleaners, obviously, locally would be a, a really good example. Um, because those organizations are facing the same challenges you are. I mean, these giant organizations have resources that none of us will ever you know, have access to. So, yeah, you can look to those guys for some things. Um, but, you know, don't be afraid to look, you know, in your community at what the smaller guys are doing. Mm -hmm. um, because they actually have maybe a little bit more freedom and agility to try different things rather than a big organization that has a lot of, you know, handcuffs for things. Um, on the content side, one that I always point to, and it's a big one, I'm sorry for that, but Cleveland Clinic. Um, their content is amazing. All they do is produce educational content. So their, their website, I mean, it rivals Wikipedia for like healthcare information and, and content of that, that nature. And that's how, that's how they market to donors and to constituents and things like that because they understand that people are, are looking for things online. They're asking questions online. They're putting questions into Google and they want to be you know, the number one or two result for those things. And they've been successful with that. That's all. I think I would go within your sector and see who uh, the big players are and then see how how they engage with people online or are they just um, putting out a lot of content and they just have a lot of followers because they have a huge service area and that's the, the people that, um, like I think for instance like North Texas Food Bank has um, a huge following and they do a really good job um, online with engaging um, with other people. But then there's also other food banks that have a large following but don't really um, engage. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, I think it just goes back in to, uh, to uh, a lot of the people that do a really good job online are the, those that are doing a really good job with the offline. Uh, so I think that... Uh, <coughs> A lot of the groups you'll see um, behind the scenes, they're probably sending thank you notes mm -hmm. to the people that are sharing their stuff on Facebook, sharing their stuff on, on Twitter. Um, and because that's what people don't get every day um, from an app mention. It, getting an app mention on your phone is awesome. But then when an organization recognizes you did a lot of work through this campaign, and that was online and sending them a thank you note at the end of that campaign saying thank you for all you did you helped us reach this goal or we came up just short so we'll, we'll try to give you more help next time um, that that just gets that person uh, more engaged on going to help you again in the future with another campaign mm -hmm. what other questions maybe that we haven't addressed Anyone? Um, do you guys have a means to collect donations like on Facebook through an app or do you send people to your web page? We send people to our website right now. Um, we've been investigating text to donate mm -hmm. um, because I think that's a really great, especially when they're in the museum, the fact that they could just text and do it um, I think would be great. Um, but I also think places like the Red Cross obviously use that in a very effective way. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's we're sort of going down that path a little bit more. Uh, our website, within the last two years, the state museum has split off from state government a little bit, which is really interesting in that the museum was founded in 1869. Until two years ago, we couldn't really raise funds because at the end of the year, everything went back to the state treasury. And so 
we're a really old institution that does not have a history of fundraising in a, a substantial way. And so that is <laughs> a very interesting thing. So in a lot of ways, we're still very much at the ground level, even though we have a very established um, base of fans, they haven't been giving fans. <laughs> so. It's a good blog post. Yeah, it's interesting. It's good. Yeah. Um, I actually think it's the mentality of my pack and taxpayer dollars paying well, for this. So why should yeah. I also donate yeah. when you've got you well, special that's, system? That's the other thing because um, essentially tax money pays for the building and to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. If you want to come see an exhibit, mm -hmm. that's all private donations. And so. Um, our building's gorgeous, but if it's empty, it's not really that fun. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, so a lot of sort of donor education and just general public education about what it, what public dollars mean to the museum. It means we can bring Star Wars to Indiana. It means we can do uh, bigger things. Uh, and being a venue, even I mean. Oh, yeah. Putting yourself out there as a as a venue yeah. for special events. Oh, yeah. well, I think every organization faces that challenge of telling people why they should donate because mm -hmm. people think my taxes pay for that. Well, you know there is SNAP and WIC and all that mm -hmm. stuff to feed people. So you, yeah. uh, you know maybe a blog or even you know Facebook is a great place where you can overcome those mm -hmm. misconceptions that people might have. And you're yeah. always going to have those people that. Think your organization sucks and shouldn't be, you know, or that their money doesn't need to go to that. But those are probably fewer than the people that just don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it uh, is another thing that people's minds are switching to think about too is those donors who have kind of overcome that mind switch on okay, there all my tax dollars are going to this, but then I decided to be a donor because. And then trying to key on those donors to create that piece of content because it goes back to what Stephen says. He gets a lot of uh, updates about Gleaners because he reads my feed rather than Gleaners feed. And I, and I work there, so I'm almost kind of don't want to put a lot because people will be like, well, I see it on Gleaners. I'm seeing the same thing on Willie. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, but yeah, so like keying in on, on those people and being able to reach out to maybe get some content that you can share on your website. Like we thought about for, for our plan giving page on our website. Like how can we spruce up plan giving? Um, and it's really like at maybe asking a couple donors who have chosen to do plan giving, mm -hmm. interviewing them, yeah. making a, a quick YouTube video and putting it on there. Because um, again, it's that peer to peer that the, the online world is really revolving around. And going back to the Facebook thing, like, just try it. Yeah. You know, you can research and you can talk to 50 experts and they're all going to have their opinions, but no one knows Boaz better than you two. Try it. If it doesn't work, you know, at least you know and you don't have to worry about, try, you know, spending time on that again. If it works, great. Hey, you know, the Boaz followers, mm -hmm. they, they don't mind giving online through Facebook. So then you know. If, so. if I wanted to run a blog post to use a fan or as a donor to cleaners, what, what kind of search tag should I use or sort of identity should I use, should I say use my Google Plus account as the sort of the vital line, you know, on the side or how do you get that return? I think transparency and who the author is, is always paramount, you know. Um, Ian, you sat through my last presentation where I talked about authorship and all these things, but like if, if Tom wrote a blog post and they published it, you know, it would be weird for it to be under Asia's name, you know, don't do that obviously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, be transparent about who you are. I am a, a patron of the museum. I'm a donor. Um, those things will add credibility. Um, but in terms of the content you write, um, even though you're not an employee, you, sh you still shouldn't be solicitous, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can tell maybe a personal story about, you know, I brought my kids to see Star Wars, it changed their life, and, and thanks, museum. You know, that kind of content is great, rather than, hey, um, I went to see... I went to see Star Wars, everyone else should go see it too. And it's kind of like, oh, that's not that great. But if you can tell a personal story of, you know, you know, your kids seeing Chewbacca for the first time and, oh, daddy, you know, that's the, that's the guy on the TV. Yeah. Like, those things are nice. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't matter who the author is, it, it, you should still not be solicitous. You should be a storyteller and a resource to people. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think um, from our side, you know, 
we, we search for that kind of stuff. If it's got Indiana State Museum in a blog, we're going to find it. Mm -hmm. um, but we also are very careful to make sure that it's not so bright, shiny, mm -hmm. sunshine and kittens all the time. If somebody has an issue in the cafe, we're just as likely to retweet that and say, yeah. here's how we're going to fix it. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. um, because we don't want it to be so salesy, you know, yeah. you feel like you just walked into a used car lot rather than, <laughs> <laughs> um, because part of, I think, our trust factor with our patrons is that we tell the full story. Mm -hmm. um, and so that has to come through in our social media, too. And I think one more important thing, too, um, I don't know how we're doing on time. But, yeah, okay. um, Oh, about two minutes. <laughs> well, is look at how good for profits are doing social media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, I think as a nonprofit sector, we kind of think of ourselves as kind of like our own way to run business. But at the very end of the day, we're all businesses, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and so the way they treat their customers are kind of the same way you kind of treat your patrons and you treat your donors. Um, obviously, the the message is different. But being um, using those engaging ways that for profits do, so maybe there's somebody that's about the same size as your nonprofit organization that has about as many customers as you have donors or volunteers or something like that, and see what.